So inshallah, in this session, we're going to look at reverence, khushur, and presence of heart in the salah. And we're going to look at Imam al-Ghazali's section on uh, the merit of reverence, of having khushur. And uh, it's important to understand a little bit of the context of the Ihya Ulum al -Din, and that people did not really, before Imam al-Ghazali, one of the amazing contributions that uh, he gave this ummah is that he was able to really merge people's understandings of the outward and the inward sciences. And as Sheikh Yahya said previously that really this is a science because of the systematic way that he actually uh, details the spiritual path and explains it in a way where he's able to break down you know, various elements and, and subpoints that are all interrelated. So one of the things that's important is that people were focused on the outward validity of the salah. Is that if the salah is valid according to the fuqaha, which is important, then the salah is considered valid. And Imam al-Ghazali is highlighting for us that if the whole purpose of the salah is to draw close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and uh, as we're going to see, وَأَقِيمِ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِ The first verse that he mentions is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, and establish the prayer for my remembrance, is that the prayer is not actually truly established if it does not contain the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says if someone is in the prayer and they don't know what they're saying and they're not uh, they don't have this reverence, they don't have khushur and presence of heart and the various inner states that uh, Imam al-Ghazali uh, mentions that Shaykh Yahya covered in session two, then really it's just movements and emptiness internally. And that's not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. So he's also uh, speaking to certain people who might not consider khushur and presence of heart as a condition for the validity and acceptance of the salah. So he's coming at it from uh, this angle. And I think for our purposes, we already understand the importance of that. So he begins with the verse that I mentioned, وَأَقِيمِ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِ Establish the prayer for my remembrance. Is to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the goal of all acts of worship and the goal of all that we do in order to seek nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to have presence of heart. So if we are in salah, you know, we want to have presence of heart because that really is the indication of coming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and truly remembering Him. When we avoid what is haram, we do so because we have presence of heart and we have an awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that he sees us and has forbidden us from that thing, so we avoid it. When we engage in charity, or we seek knowledge, or we attend a gathering of dhikr, the goal in that is to have presence of heart. وَأَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِ Establish the prayer for my remembrance. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another verse of the Qur'an, وَلَا تَكُمْ مِنَ الْغَافِلِينَ and do not be of those who are heedless and neglectful. Do not be of those who are heedless and neglectful. So Imam al-Ghazali says, if someone makes an oath that they're going to speak to the king or they're going to engage in a particular uh, uh, verbal statement, I swear that I will say this particular thing. And then while they're asleep, they actually talk in their sleep and they say what they swore that they were going to say. He says they actually haven't fulfilled their oath because they were not conscious of it. So even though they might have said unconsciously what they uh, swore that they would say, because they were not conscious when they did it, it doesn't count. So the same can be said about the salah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another verse of the Quran, لا تقربوا الصلاة وأنتم سكارى حتى تعلموا ما تقولون Do not approach the prayer while you are intoxicated until you know what it is that you are saying. And Imam al-Ghazali, he says, 
how many a person who's engaging in the salah has not uh, uh, has not consumed alcohol or is not intoxicated, but does not know what they are saying in the prayer. So he says, okay, that part about while you are drunk or while you are intoxicated does not apply to the generality of believers and people avoiding that act that is haram. But then he says the condition that's associated with it still applies. Hatta ta'lamu ma taqulun until you know you're aware of what it is that you are saying. So Imam al-Ghazali says if a person is praying and they're unaware of what they're saying, and that applies to presence of heart and understanding that Shaykh Yahya covered in the previous session, then, uh, you know, uh, then they, they still fall within this category. Do not approach the prayer in that state. So you have to be aware of that. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he said in a hadith, مَنْ صَلَّى رَكْعَتَيْنِ لَمْ يُحَدِّثْ نَفْسَهُ فِيهِمَا بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الدُّنْيَا غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ Whoever prays two rak'ahs and their nafs does not, uh, you know, you are not, uh, you are not listening or giving the opportunity to your nafs to speak to you about things of the world, the reward for having that level of presence in the sada is that Allah forgives your previous sins. So once again, Imam al-Ghazali is saying, this is critical for the prayer to be accepted, to be of those people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they establish a true prayer, they're transformed. And they avoid al-fahsha wal munkar indecency and wrongdoing by being present in the salah, by not giving in to the insinuations and the internal conversations of the nafs that take us into the dunya. And what we're going to look at shortly is how to identify those outward and inward distractions and how to deal with them. We'll get to that inshallah ta'ala. But if a person has that level of presence, their previous sins are forgiven. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, he also said in another hadith, إِنَّمَا فُرِضَتِ الصَّلَاةُ وَأُمِرَ بِالْحَجِّ وَالطَّوَافِ وَأَشْعَرَةِ الْمَنَاسِكُ لِإِقَامَةِ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam said in a hadith narrated by Abu Dawood and At-Tirmidhi, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the prayer an obligation and commanded the hajj and the circumambulation and the various rites of worship associated with the hajj for what purpose? In order to establish the remembrance of Allah the Exalted. In order to establish the remembrance of Allah the Exalted. So that's an indication once again that the khushur is the life of the prayer. The khushur is the life of the prayer. No. And Imam al-Ghazali then gives us another, uh, another very useful way of understanding how we get into that mindset. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we might sometimes hear, sometimes the Imam, when leading the prayer, will say this, pray a farewell prayer. That the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's the one who said, وَإِذَا صَلَّيْتَ فَصَلِّ صَلَاتَ مُوَدِّعِينَ if you pray, then pray the prayer of someone who is bidding farewell. And Imam al-Ghazali says there are many layers of meaning to this farewell. What does it mean to bid farewell? Imam al-Ghazali then says, this is not part of the hadith, that a person is saying farewell to his own nafs. Farewell to your insinuations and your desires and your love of the world. Farewell to the nafs. Farewell to one's passions. They're not thinking about those things in the salah, ideally. And then he says, farewell to one's life. So they say that as if you're bidding farewell, that this is the last prayer that you will pray before you meet your Lord. And if that was the case, that would be a transformative prayer. If someone knew, let's say, for example, may Allah protect us, that there was 
someone oppressive who said, you know, I'm going to execute you and take your life, you have one last prayer that you can pray. What would be the state of that prayer before you know that you're going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It would be full of khushur and full of hope and full of fear and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the most important things and not being distracted by anything. Allah, there is nothing. What am I going to think about the world for when it's done? So the Messenger of Allah وسلم, is telling us that when you have that mindset, that is the way you are supposed to pray. That's how you truly access the khushur in the salah. La ilaha illallah. Now, I'm one of the pious predecessors, and this relates to what Imam al-Ghazali said previously. He said, Ibn Adam, O son of Adam, O human being, if you want to enter into the presence of your Lord without permission, without a formal invitation, you know, the kings of the world, special time, special, you have to talk to the right person, you, have, you might have to pay people some bribes, to, you might owe some favors and all of that type of stuff in order to get to the people of the dunya. If you want to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's saying, if you want to enter his presence without even a formal invitation or permission, you can do so. He said, how so? He said, you make your wudu and you enter into your mihrab and then you enter into the presence of your Lord without any formal permission. And you get to speak to him without any translator. Like it's that level of nearness and intimacy. You know, someone will at least have a representative or someone who's going to keep the time, you can only speak for this long. In these formal settings of the people of the dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has left the door open whenever you want. In dua, in salah, in turning your heart to Him, the door is always open. Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha, she's telling us here about the state of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how this relates to khushur the complete focus and priority he would give the salah. That she said, and you know, she's the wife of the Prophet so she knows, you know, some of these private details and intimate details that maybe other people might not have been privy to or might not have witnessed. So she says, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was at home, he would speak with us and we would speak with him. That we would have these family conversations and he would listen to them and they would, say things about what was interesting to them or their day or what they were going through and the Prophet would listen and then he would also talk to them and this is actually a beautiful sunnah that uh, uh, not many people are really aware of is that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, he would speak to the Sahaba about whatever they wanted to talk about so oh, Messenger of Allah you know my camel is kind of not feeling well you know oh really what how what's going on and he would, he would engage and entertain whatever was important to them, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And his heart is with Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But look at the mercy. You know, and and uh, there are many, many beautiful examples of that. You know, and I'm reminding myself and all of us, especially with, you know, these devices and kind of being, having our attention always, you know, scattered, is that when you're with someone, it's a sunnah to give them your full attention. And even physically, the Messenger of Allah said, when he would turn to someone, he would turn to them with the entirety of his body to give them that full attention. If that is the consideration that he gave to other created beings out of his mercy and his noble character, imagine when it's time to stand in the mihrab. Imagine when it's the time that he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yearns for the most to be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Sayyidina Aisha is saying that he would talk to us and we would talk to him. But when the time for the prayer entered, the adhan goes off, it's time for salah. It's as if he didn't know us and we didn't know him. There was nothing else in the world except responding to the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma salli alayhi wa ala alayhi. And just imagine that he would say, Arihna biha ya Bilal. You know, give us, bring the, uh, what brings us comfort. Give us what brings us comfort, O Bilal. And that was the adhan because it was the uh, initiation or the beginning of entering into the salah. 
The Prophet وسلم, said, لا ينظر الله إلى صلاة لا يحضر الرجل فيها قلبه مع بدنه. That Allah does not look at a prayer in which a person's heart is not present with their body. And what does that mean? It means that they're present in the salah. When they say that, you know, your heart is present, like, where, where are you? Someone might be here, say, where are you? Because their heart is somewhere else, their mind, their imagination is somewhere else. No, you have to be here with Allah, that your heart is present with the rest of your body. It's not just the movements in the salah, which is once again an indication of acceptance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam al-Ghazali mentions that Prophet Ibrahim al-Khalil alayhi salam he said when he would enter, when he would stand up to pray, they could hear the intensity of his heartbeat from two miles away. That his heart would beat with such power and there was a reverberation from his heartbeats that people could hear it from two miles away because of the, 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 the magnitude of standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La ilaha illallah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he saw a man, he saw a man playing with his beard in the salah. So a man playing with his beard in the salah and he was praying, just kind of going. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لَوْ خَشَعَ قَلْبُ هَذَا If this man's heart had reverence and this awe before Allah, لَخَشَعَتْ جَوَارِحُ His limbs would follow suit and be in awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I remember hearing our teacher, Habib Umar, commenting on people sometimes they have, like if you have like a, a idal or a shmag, and he said every couple of seconds a person's fixing what's on their, their headgear and they're moving things around. He said, you know, how can someone do that while standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And so you have, to, you have to be careful, even to the extent that they say if you're wearing, for example, like it's a sunnah to wear a rida, to wear like a shawl. For, for the, you know that when a person is praying, if they feel that it's going to move around and fall around and flap around, that they put it on the ground in front of them so that it doesn't distract them. And so, you know, if a person's heart has khushur, the limbs will follow suit. And it's not something that is kind of this... Uh, you know, this uh, synthetic, like this manufactured fake way of having where a person just goes like this and they kind of, you know, overdo it physically. No, but it's, it's a balance. Everything is a balance. And it really is, yes, if your heart is present with Allah, maybe there might be an impact on the way that you uh, stand or the way that you move. But the aslad is to begin with the heart and to have just the sunnah balanced way of standing and having moderation in all things. And then if someone feels a particular verse, I remember one of the most amazing things I ever experienced. And I was young, I was like 22 at the time, when I first uh, was blessed to go study in, in Hadramaut in Yemen, at Dar al-Mustafa, and it was Ramadan. And there were just so many things that happened where it was like, wow, this deen is real. Like, you know, it's, but then there's like things that happen, like, this deen is real. You know, you see it lived at that level. It's different. So I remember it was Salatul Taraweeh, and we're talking about prayer, and this is really, you know, this is just kind of a beautiful example, especially in today's world. There are people like that today. Where I remember it's the first night of Ramadan, if I'm not mistaken, it happened multiple times on multiple nights. But the Imam was, was reciting the Quran in Salatul Taraweeh, and it was, it was very majestic. The way he recited the first night of Ramadan, it, it felt like you really, we always, we always feel it, alhamdulillah, many people really notice that when Ramadan comes in, there's like this shift in the cosmos. Something has changed. So it was intensified because being in the company of such people. And then there was a man that I heard, uh, you know, somewhere to the left or behind, or wherever he was standing, and as the Qur'an was being recited and it was intense, he said, Allah, Allah, Allah. And he passed out. You know, and I'm praying and I'm just kind of like, what, what? Like, I can't look back and see who it, I never, I never saw who it was. And uh, just subhanAllah, and I was like, this deen is real. Like you hear about the Sahaba, 
being bedridden for days and, and weeks from the Qur'an. You know, and, and it's like the Qur'an here is not just some somebody with a nice voice who recites it and there's inshallah good in that. But it was like this is the Qur'an that you realize if it was revealed to the mountain, the mountain would, would crumble underneath the, the weightiness of the Qur'an. Like there are people whose hearts, you know, are, are present with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And once again, you can't fake that level of presence. I was someone of a special state with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it goes to show that there are still people experiencing these really uh, powerful realities of the salah. <laughs> Mashallah. And then Imam Al Ghazali tells us a few stories of people who had such a high level of khushur in the salah that they were totally uh, unaffected by their surroundings. Right? But that's a very high level. And as Imam Al Ghazali is going to tell us shortly when he talks about the way to have presence of heart, that is a very select few of people who attain that level. Where, for example, uh, Sayyidina Ali Zain al Abidin was praying, and one of the pillars in the masjid uh, broke, and there was a, a large you know, sound and a crash that happened when it took place. And after he was done with the salah, they asked him, What did you see? You were in the masjid when the pillar broke, and, it, and he didn't hear anything. And there was a Sahabi who had to have his leg amputated. He said, You know, when you, it's going to be intense, it's painful. He said, amputate my leg when I'm in the salah. These are the realities that the Sahaba had, radiallahu anhum, and they amputated it, and he uh, became aware of it after he finished his prayer. Radiallahu anhum. Now, these stories are not meant to make us feel like, oh, I'm so terrible, I can't even do 1% of that. But it's a, it's, it shows us the potential and the possibility and when we hear about these great people, it is meant to encourage us and inspire us, not the other way around. Like, oh, I'm never going to be like that. I I'm, might as well, you know, pack my bags and just like, I'm useless. I can't do that. No, that's not what we want. See, inshallah, the one who gave to them can also give to me, subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one who chose those people to be of the people of nearness to him can choose me, inshallah, to be of those people. Each and every one of us, inshallah ta'ala. And the fact that Allah has brought us together to study on how to pray properly is a sign that Allah has extended His mercy to us. And we ask Him for tawfiq. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Kana Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu anhu wa karrama wajhu idha hadara waqtu salah yatazalzalu wa yatalawanu wajhuhu. Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib, may Allah be well pleased with him and ennoble his countenance. When the time for prayer would enter, he would start to shake and his face would change color. They said, Malaka ya Amir al Mu'minin. So, what's going on, O commander of the believers? And he said, The time has come to fulfill the covenant, the trust that Allah presented to the heavens and the earth and the mountains and they refused it and were in fear of it and we are the ones who took it on. Indicating that that amana that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran is the salah. So he, the level of reverence, the level of khushur and presence of heart of recognizing once again the significance of what we're about to engage in and stand in. <clears throat> And then we'll, we'll end with this narration. It's a really beautiful uh, narration. MashaAllah. Uh, on the, uh, the, this is a statement of Hatim al-Asam, one of the great pious predecessors, radiallahu anhu. And someone once asked him about his prayer. So he said, when the time for prayer enters, أَسْبَغْتُ wudu, I perform the wudu well, fully uh, covering all the limbs and doing it with presence of heart and intentionality and recognizing that this is the key into the prayer. And I came and I come to the pray the place where I am going to pray. And I actually sit there. I'm going to talk about this shortly. I sit there until I am collected. 
that I become collected. Then I stand to prayer. So then I place the Kaaba. This is a way of using our imagination in a way that is uh, useful and uh, beneficial, especially spiritually, is to use the faculty of imagination for things like this. He says, then I place the Kaaba before my very eyes, imagining it. It's as if I'm standing right in front of the Kaaba. And I place the Sirat that goes over hellfire, the, tra the traverse that goes over hellfire, I place it at my feet. It's as if I can see it at my feet. And I imagine paradise to my right. And I imagine the fire to my left. And I imagine the angel of death standing behind me. And I think and ponder deeply that this will be my final prayer. Then I stand and pray and I am between the state of hope and fear. So I begin the prayer and I say, Allahu Akbar. And I recite the Quran with tartil, full uh, recitation, giving each of the letters its right and reciting properly and with reverence. And then when I go into ruku'ah, the bowing position, I do so with humility. And when I go into prostration, I prostrate uh, with a reverential fear, with this khushur. And, uh, you know, when I sit in the position, I do so with sincerity. And when I, I try to have sincerity of heart, and when I finish the prayer, I do not know, has it been accepted from me or not? Even after all of that, I still remain in a state between hope and fear. Is it accepted or not? And Sayyidina Abdullah ibn al-Abbas radiallahu anhuma, he said, ركعتاني مقتصدتان في تفكر خير من قيام ليلة والقلب ساه. He says two rak'ahs that you perform with you know well, that you're not rushed and hasty in completing. That uh, but even مقتصدتان is that they're not very long and they're not rushed. Just even two uh, uh, moderate rak'ahs that are not very long that you pray while you are reflecting and pondering what you're reciting and thinking about your state with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all of the things associated with the prayer is better for you than standing up the entire night in prayer and your heart is heedless. Just two brief, moderate rak'ahs with reflection are better than an entire night where your heart is heedless. So we have to have, now the great salihin, they have quality and quantity. But for us, sometimes people think that quantity alone is sufficient. No, but you want quality. We want quality. And when we have, when we focus on that, then when we start to access the real fruits of the salah, then we want more of it. And quantity starts to uh, become very naturally accessible and desirable to us. So now moving on to the section on the distractions and how we have presence of heart in the face of uh, these distractions, the outward and inward distractions. So Imam al-Ghazali, he says, beautifully here, he talks about the inner states of the prayer that Shaykh Yahya covered. That a believer has to be in a state of reverence for Allah the Mighty and Majestic, in fear of Him, hope and having hope in Him, having this haya, this shame before Him for one's own shortcomings. And that these states, they are never totally separated from the believer according to the degree of his or her certitude and faith. That there are people who are at higher levels, uh, and people who might experience it from time to time, but it is never totally separated from a believer. Imam. He says, and that's their state outside of the salah. So then it is only taken away from them or it is only absent in the salah due to al-khawatir al-waridah al-shaghila. These passing thoughts that come 
that busy a person. So if a person in the salah is not having these states that very naturally a believer should have and does have, if they are uh, you know, not present as they should be in the salah, it's due to these passing thoughts. So the treatment in order to have presence of heart is actually rejecting and repelling these passing thoughts. وَلَا يُدْفَعُ شَيْءُ إِلَّا بِدَفْعِ سَبَبِهِ And this is where Imam al-Ghazali is very systematic. He says you cannot uh, repel something or deflect that thing or push it away except by finding its root cause. You have to get to the root of it and deal with that in order to truly do so. تمام? فَلْتَعْلَمْ سَبَبَهِ So you have to come to know the reason behind them. And the reason is that it could be either an outward cause or it could be something within the person internally, inwardly. So then he breaks down both. As for the outward, uh, as for the outward, he says that these are the things that pass through the thoughts and what a person sees. These are the things that a person might hear or see when they're in the middle of the salah. You know, like you're in the middle of the prayer, you know, we all have this and there's like a loud sound or, you know, your kids like start crying or they're hitting each other. It's kind of, what's going on? It takes up your thoughts. The khawatir are now coming. The passing thoughts are now, who hit who? Whose fault was it? You know, and you start to go through that. Uh, those various thoughts that are all interconnected and associated. Tamam? Or you see something. You know, oh, that person parked again in that parking spot, right? You know, and you start to be affected by those things. That can then take a person's focus and take them to a totally different place, okay? And that it just keeps going, you know, it's like down the rabbit hole. There's just another passing thought that leads to another passing thought that leads to another passing thought. And before you know it, you're like, how did I, how was I even thinking about, like, where did this thought come from? Why am I thinking about this really random thing, especially in the middle of my salah, and I don't even know how I got there. Come on. Okay. Uh, no. So then he says the treatment for that is قَطْعُ هَذِهِ الْأَسْبَابِ بِأَنْ يَغِضَّ بَصَرَهِ So the way to treat that is that you cut off all of these kind of internal stimulations by being in a place where your, uh, your sight is covered. That you're praying in an area that is closed off such that you're not seeing things from the outside world that would then distract you. Or that a person uh, prays in their house and it's very dim or dark such that they're not looking around and seeing other things. Or he doesn't have something in front of him that would attract his senses. Oh, this, uh, for example, Imam al-Ghazali mentions that uh, having a very colorful prayer rug, that could be distracting. Having a very ornamented, designed prayer rug can be distracting. And in the commentary, the Ithaf al-Sa'il of Imam al-Zabidi, he says that one of the worst innovations is these extra ornate masajid with all these etchings everywhere and very uh, overly ornamented. He says one of the worst innovations that has taken place and it's actually not befitting for having presence in the salah. And it's the sunnah of the Prophet and this is a beautiful example, is to actually just have things very simple in the masjid. And some of the most amazing masajid that I've ever been to are very outwardly simple. They're still beautiful, they're very beautiful, but they're simple. You know, there's just, it's just white walls, simple a prayer carpet, and that's it. Place for the mushaf, place for the, 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 the copy of the Quran, and that's it. And you go in there and you say, SubhanAllah, there's just a, a presence that the place, there's, it brings you to be present with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Then you go to another place and it's got all of these 
million dollar chandelier and you know imported all of these things and it's overdone now beautifying places is a good thing but it's really about having presence of heart yeah. and min ha'itin says or that you pray close to a wall uh, so that you're not able to see anything beyond the place of your prayer that you just look at the place of your sujood or you're not distracted you can't see anything outside of where you are praying نعم. And this is why the people who dedicated themselves to worship, they would often do so in a very small space that was dimly lit. And if you've ever visited the khalwa places of many of the salihin in many Muslim countries, you can find places where great ulama and great salihin uh, would engage in ibadah. And they're usually very tight. They don't have all these windows and all the, these things coming in. They're usually, or if there is a window, it's kind of covered with a, you know, like a wooden covering or something just to get a little bit of light in. And they're not distracted by anything of the world. It's very simple. And it's almost kind of, you know, cramped. And how many people would actually go and read Quran? And, you know, we hear of the Salihin who would dig their own grave and read do khatams of Quran in their graves. Why? Because it helps you have presence of heart. This is, this is, I'm not distracted by anything in the world in a place like this or in a moment like this. No. So you found that many people in this ummah of the great Salihin, they would engage in their ibadah in a very small and dimly lit place that was only big enough for them to actually engage in sujood. لِيَكُونَ ذَلِكَ أَجْمَعْ لِلْهَمْ so Because that place helped actually collect all of their focus and remain focused and determined to only be present in the prayer. وَالْأَقْوِيَاءِ مِنْهُمْ And the, those who were, had a, a strength and a great ability كَانُوا يَحْضُرُونَ الْمَسَاجِدِ وَيَغُضُّونَ الْبَصَرِ Even when they would attend the prayer in the masjid, they would still keep their sight in the place of their sujood. They wouldn't look around. Even those who had a certain level of experience and steadfastness in their ibadah, even then, to be care they would be careful not to uh, risk losing their presence of heart. Yeah. And the great salihin, they would consider it from the, the completion or the perfection of the prayer is that you are so present in the salah and that you are not distracted by anything around you to such an extent that you don't even know who prayed to your right or to your left. Like let's say you know the person, but once the salah is done, you say, oh, that was you? Oh, I wasn't focused on that. That the person was present with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this, these are the outward causes and the treatment. The treatment is simple, is that you just minimize your distractions. And even Imam al-Ghazali mentions, and he's going to mention this in the inward distractions, that we have to find ways of collecting ourselves before we enter into the salah. And that's one of the great wisdoms of even having these sunnah prayers and uh, supererogatory prayers before the fard prayer so that we are continuing to deepen our level of presence and prepare ourselves to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that we say the, you know, ayatul kursi and various, and various invocations before we enter into the salah to help collect ourselves and to be present with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those are the outward distractions and how to uh, deal with them and the treatment for them. As for the inward distractions, Imam al-Ghazali says, فَهِيَ أَشَدْ This is even more difficult than the outward. Outward is just turn off the lights, be present, turn off your phone, don't think about anything else and just pray. But the inward, he said, is more difficult. فَإِنَّ مَنْ تَشَعَّبَتْ بِهِ الْهُمُومُ فِي أَوْدِيَةِ الدُّنْيَا لَمْ يَنْحَصَرْ فِكْرُهُ فِي فَنٍ وَاحِدٍ so whoever's concerns are taken through the valleys of the various uh, uh, channels of worldliness, they won't just be thinking about one thing alone. 
A person might, if they see something, say, what's that noise? And they think about that. But if a person has an internal distraction, they can be taken to all different types of places. That their, their thoughts are flying from one area to the next. In terms of, you know, vastly different khawatir and passing thoughts that might not come to them. And Imam al-Ghazali is saying, if a person, even if they're in a place where there are no outward distractions, that they're in a small room and it's dark, that that doesn't prevent them, that doesn't save them from these types of inward distractions, okay? So he says, uh, uh, so the way to deal with that is, that the first thing is to force, and this is a really a beautiful and powerful word. One of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Qahar, the one who is overpowering and dominating, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That he, this is the word that's used here, and yarud al nafsa qahran that a person dominates and forces the nafs to return back to contemplating and understanding the words that are being recited in the salah, okay? And to focus and to force it to focus on that over all other things. And what helps a person do that is that they prepare before they enter into the prayer and that they remind themselves of the hereafter and that they will stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the result of that judgment is, is significant, is so significant and dangerous that they need to think of that in the moment of the salah. Okay? That it is such an intense, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the, the disbelievers on that day, subhanAllah, I just learned the meaning of this ayah recently, that the disbelievers on that day they, when they see the scales and when they see the judgment, they will be in such terror that they will look up and their eyes will be in such horror that they'll be wide-eyed and they won't even be able to blink. For how many years will they be experiencing that where it will be so intense that they won't even be able to blink? So you remind yourself of that in the salah. What would I be like if I was true and I am? But if the veil was lifted and I'm standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what kind of adab and presence would I have? So you remind your nafs of that. So uh, this is a really practical and beautiful reminder that Imam al-Ghazali gives us. And he says, another practical thing you can do before entering the prayer is that if you have any, anything that you're doing and you want to tie some loose ends, you know, that you're, you have something on the, in the oven, you have, you know, something that you're waiting for, there's so, something going on that is occupying your thoughts that you actually finish doing those things and that comes to an end before you engage in the prayer. Because then he's, oh, my alarm's going off, it's still not, it's gonna burn. Uh, I'm waiting for this important phone call. A person's constantly going to be thinking about those things in the salah. That you try your very best to, uh, you know, tie all those loose ends so that when you enter into the salah, there's nothing on your mind. You know, one of the things that we have to do is, you know, put our phones on silent, maybe even put it in a totally different room and just enjoy the salah. When we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, we will not regret, oh, that phone call I missed or that text message I missed and whatever it may have been for those moments that we are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So just having, you know, practically taking the, the means available to us, anything that's, that's, oh, I have to write this email, oh, it's extremely, do that and then engage in the prayer with presence of heart. Naam. So Imam al-Ghazali says, this is how you actually calm yourself from all of these various thoughts, okay? And then he says, how do you deal with it at the root? So this is, he's saying, this is helpful for just having these passing thoughts that are coming through to kind of deal with them in the moment. 
But then he says, how do you deal with it at the root? And he says, you have to look at these things that are occupying your mind, that busy you. And you have to say, where is the source from which they're coming from? And Imam al-Ghazali says, the things that busy you are the things that you find important. You're not going to think about things that are not important to you. So he says, and then you realize that those things that are important to you, if they're distracting you in the salah, and they're, they seem more important in that moment than what you're actually in, he says that those stem from your desires. Those thoughts stem from what's important to you. What's important to you, if it's getting in the way of your salah, it stems from your shahawat, stems from your desires. So then the way that a person disciplines the nafs is by cutting off those attachments. It is really trying to uproot those desires and cutting off those attachments. And really that is freedom. You know, now even in a material sense, people are talking about, you know, minimalism and things of that nature. You know, what you own, owns you. And not living like, like that anymore. But actually realizing that there's so man, many more meaningful things, even in a worldly sense, more than all of these things that occupy us. So you have to get to the root of it and cut that out. Because everything that distracts that person in his salah is contradictory to his deen. And it is the soldiers of Iblis and one of his, uh, uh, the Muslim's enemies. So holding on to that thing. And he mentions the story of the Prophet And this is for us to learn. That the Messenger of Allah وسلم, he had a ring. And he, when he was giving the khutbah, he delivered the khutbah and he would look at his new ring sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And then he said, this ring has distracted me and he gave it away, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to teach us how you break those attachments. And if this is getting in the way, I'm going to give it away. I don't need it. And that way I will be light before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then uh, finally, he tells us a few stories of some of the Sahaba. So, Aba Talha, uh, that Abu Talha, he was pr pr uh, praying in an enclosed place where he had some trees there. So as he was praying, he saw a little bird that flew from the trees and he was impressed by the beauty of the bird. So he said that his eyesight followed the bird. So when he was done, he mentioned to the Messenger of Allah وسلم, the tribulation that he was afflicted with. Look at the level of the Sahaba. It's a bird flying. The tribute, but he's, this got in the way of my salah, so this is one of my enemies. And one of the things that is harming my deen. So then he said to the Prophet وسلم, I give away that, those trees in that area that I was praying in, that I own, I give it away sadaqa for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't want it anymore. He let go of it. And another, uh, 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 another man did the same thing, and he gave it to Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan, and Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan sold that garden for 50,000 uh, uh, dirhams or dinars. That he sold it for 50,000. It was very valuable. He got rid of it because it got in the way of his deen. So we have to really, Imam al-Ghazali, he's going deep. If you want to uproot the tree that is bearing rotten fruit, you have to uproot it. So they did that so they could cut off the source of all of these passing thoughts. And also as an expiation for their shortcomings in the salah. So this is the medicine, this is the treatment. And it is bitter. It is difficult, but this is the treatment. Because what we mentioned about forcing your nafs to listen to what's being said in the salah, that's a, a temporary, easier approach, and it won't solve the problem long term. Okay? So he says, and that works for weak desires. But if someone loves the world, 
then they won't be able to do that. And then finally, he gives us this, this example. He says, it's like a man who is trying to focus and he just wants to reflect and he's sitting under a tree and he just wants peace of mind. And every so often a bird comes and starts chirping above his head and flying in the branches and just takes a branch and he hits the bird and it flies away. And then it comes right back. He hits the bird and it flies away. So like, now I can think. The bird comes right back. He hits it again. And then someone tells him, you gotta cut down the tree. You gotta figure out a way. You know, we're not, now when we're, you know, more environmentally conscious, people don't like that. But he's saying you have to cut down the tree of the desires so that the bird of these passing thoughts has nothing to come back to. And then you can actually sit and think and be present. Yeah. La ilaha illallah. And he said all of these desires, if you really get to the, the source of it and the heart of it, it is love of the world. And you have to really strive and struggle against that. And he says, nobody is perfect. He said, there are very few people who can have you know, a prayer that is completely filled with presence of heart with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, la matma fihi li amthali. Now that's from his humility. So someone like us doesn't have hope in that. And even for us just to have half of it or a third of it safe from these insinuations and these whisperings, even that's an improvement. Even that's an improvement. He said, at the very least, we'll have mixed some good with our shortcomings. But what he's telling us here is once again not to make us lose hope, but rather to say that we have to work hard and we have to do better. So he says, it's like the love of the world and having presence of heart, it's like one vessel. Your heart is like one vessel. And love of the world is like vinegar. And presence of heart with Allah is like water. So the two are not ever gonna mix. But he said, the more water you pour in, the more it will eventually push out the vinegar and fill it up. Which gives us hope to say that wherever we are, we just strive to do a little bit better, and then a little bit better, and a little bit better. And it's about consistency and really seeking uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's assistance and support. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakumullahu khayran. And inshallah, I will transition shortly. Uh, to session four, the inner meanings of prayer. And this is really beautiful. Please, you know, this is kind of, well, everything is leading to, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakumullahu khayran. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.